Good Wednesday morning. We again, it was still continuing. It's chapter 8, John 31 and 42. And this is an interesting exchange. Jesus said to the Jews who believed him, those would be the Pharisees who believed in him to some degree. If you remain in my word, you'll truly be my disciple and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. What a powerful line. That is a true line. To, my word or the truth will set you free. Anyone, that's really a profoundly true claim. Even and apart from Christ, truth is always liberating from the darkness of ignorance. Ignorance ain't a virtue. And the truth of Christ frees us from the most fundamental of all ignorances, the ignorance that death is final. I really mean that, too. I wonder... So many of my friends, so many, so many, and I don't blame them, I just, not at all. I think if I were in a passionist, I'm not sure I'd be a Christian. <laughs> you know, I was the bother because I contemplate the cross of Christ all my, all my life, all my adult life. And once you contemplate the death of Christ on the cross on Good Friday, you have hope that both life and meaning, uh, that life has meaning, that life and death have meaning that you're not caught in the trap of time, the trap. See, time is diminishing. The philosopher of Africa, North Whitehead, wrote that time is perpetual perishing. When you get old, you realize, as the funeral I went to this morning, when you know that life is perishing, there's some solace in the fact that did uh, Jerry Cobain lived to be 90 years old? She had seven children, 25 grandchildren, and 15 great-grandchildren. Got to play and see them with them all. That's, that's, that's solace in that. But her daughter-in-law, Karen, was only in her 50s. And what about all the children who have died who are young? Think of the war that's going on now in the Ukraine. How many children are dying? See, how many children starve to death? Places like Africa. See? Once you start looking at death and you're looking at life, okay? Life is not just. Would that it were, but it ain't. Neither the, neither the human life in the sense of the community of life, even justice, is there really justice in life? Do the bad guys always lose? This always like the movies, the bad guys lose? How many good, bad guys die in their bed when they're 90 years old having lived criminal lives? I'm not so sure of all that. See what I'm saying? And the natural evils are indifferent to the human heart. You could be as good as gold and die of cancer. You could be as rotten as they come, morally speaking, live to be old. Right? Death doesn't play sides. And when you try to justify it and say what is fair or good, it's very, very difficult to pin it down, and we have a temptation to do so. We try to pin a reason on it so that we can find solace in it. But you can't. Not in the end. The suffering of the innocent, the suffering of the innocent destroys the logic of justice. The suffering of the innocent destroys the logic of justice. There isn't any, or very little justice in life. There is some, of course, but not really. Not once you look hard and fast at the suffering of the human community or the suffering of the earth. See, we seek justice, we strive for it in the political and social arena, of course, we do. But does it always work out that way? Hardly, hardly. And on a broader scale beyond the human community and when it comes to what we call natural evil, the sufferings that come from disease and all the circumstances of life, where's the fairness? Even Aristotle, for all his genius, and he, he thought, uh, he even said it, we live, uh, the virtuous life will lead to eudaimonia, happiness, a uh, very fruitful life. <laughs> but he had a kicker line in it. If you're lucky, to, if you're lucky enough to live in a just society, <laughs> you get better, you still need to be in a just society. So he even knew, even if you live a good, you're a good guy, you live in according to your virtues, doesn't mean you're going to be happy. Life isn't that fair, and he knew it. They weren't stupid people. Those Mediterranean, those Greeks were sharp. They were struggling with good and evil, as were the prophets and the New Testament. These are not written in some abstract manner. They were written in the, in the turbulence of life itself and the social arena, social convulsions. 
they understood life and they were addressing it in these documents, these things that they write. Christ is a healer in the real world where there's real suffering. And when he says you're a slave to sin, you, you know, he's right. And the son of the son, part of the sin is the sin of ignorance in some ways or manner, see, right? The truth will set you free. But what truth? It's the truth of the gospel. It's not just scientific truth or social truth or philosophical truth. That's not sufficient to redeem you. You need something that can radicalize the good and evil in this world in such a manner that good will triumph over evil, that good will ultimately tri triumph, that life will triumph over death, that there is a final right order of things, a final justice, that there is a final justice, but that is in... That is in the eternal order of things. You're not going to find it in this world. We strive for it. But you have to also know that death eliminates all effort, that it is perpetual perishing. The difference between the Christian and the non-Christian, seems to me, is the hope that in perishing, think of Christ perishing on the cross, there is, in a sense, the birth of eternity all things are made right. The ancient Greeks strove for that. You can read Plato. Plato was looking for the right order of things. He knew it wasn't here. And even Aristotle appealed to good luck. <laughs> you know, it's not. They, they were sort of smart guys. They saw. They were struggling. I think with the ancient Jews, the survival, in a sense, the way you came to grips with life was the survival of the family tribe, the tribal survival. I believe that. And I see if you don't have a thought of an afterlife, or if you don't have Christ, then you're stuck because you're stuck looking at death in the eyes and she ain't pretty. Because she wipes out the good and the bad, the beautiful and the ugly, and wipes it all out. Remember the song, Alfie? What's it all about, Alfie? I tell that my kids in class, what's it all about, Alfie? You see, it's got to be more. There has to be more. And it's not within... It's not within this life. This life is, not, is just and fair to a degree, but it, isn't adipse, it is not radically just or free. In the end, in the end, time, wipes, uh, time through death wipes everything out. See, it wipes it all out. Unless in time and through death, St. Paul says, we fill up those things wanting in the suffering of Christ. In the center, we are conjoined to the death of Christ on the cross that all death is a set participation in the death of Christ in the cross, then we rise with him. And therefore, we are people who grieve with hope. We're not fools. We're not looking at a panacea. We are looking life right in the eyes, and we're not blinking. But we don't blink. We stare into the reality of life and death, but with hope. Because we stare into the, into the cross of Christ. We see the death of Christ as the birth of eternity. And we share directly in that death. We fill up those things, wanting in the suffering of Christ. And so we share in his resurrection. And with that, the final order of goodness and the triumph of goodness and beauty, life over death, justice over injustice, truly light over darkness, life over death, goodness over evil. <laughs>